Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. And, uh, warm welcome to the eighth session of our webinar on cellular automata. Uh, actually, we are planning to conclude this series by another session on 28th February, where uh, we have requested our sir, Professor Shukanta Das, to deliver a lecture on reachability tree, a characterization tool at the age of cellular automata technology. And I invite every one of you to join us on that program also. Today's topic is, does robust computation exist? Some reflections on asynchronous and probabilistic cellular automata. And are, we are delighted to have among us Professor Najim Fares as our speaker. Professor Fares has been working as a full-time at the INRIA Institute France. He has worked as an associate professor in my MAIA, Machine Intelligence Ottomans, uh, Autonomes team, and worked in Maya team in Rio, France. Since 2015, he is also working in L'Oreal lab in the uh, in the another team in, in Rio, France. So uh, he has done his doctorate in 2004 from France and masters in 2000 from University of Lille, France. He received Another master's degree in 2000 in history and philosophy of science. And he was awarded the Erin Mainix Prize from the French Association for the Promotion of Science in 2005. He has authored more than 50 articles in reputed journals and conferences and worked as vice chair for the, uh, for the most important working group in cellular automatic conference communities that is ifip working group 1.5 and discrete complex systems he is also a member of the editorial board of the journal of cellular automata his research interests include complex systems with focus on stochastic cellular automata and reactive multi-agent systems he's also interested in studying noise effects on the behavior of cellular models and the order on the design of models which makes use of randomness as a help to perform robust calculations. And his simulator, which he's going to show us also, Fiat Labs, it is an excellent simulator in Java for cellular automata and other discrete dynamical system. We have been eagerly waiting to hear from him for a very long time, and finally we have got him. So it's uh, we are delighted to have him. So I, like, I would like to request him to start now. Over to you, sir. All right. Thank you very much, Kamalika. Thank you for your for this, uh, presentation. It's a great pleasure to be among you, well, with the mediation uh, of, of uh, the, the screen, of course, which does not make things uh, uh, easy, but I'm very happy to be, to, to be with you all. And I hope that we will have soon the opportunity to meet uh, in real, <laughs> physically, or all, all together. So uh, my, my talk uh, is entitled, Does Robust Computation Exist? By this, I mean that uh, there certainly is two directions with regard to computation. First of all, we can think of computation as uh, an ideal process, okay? You have input, you make some computation, you get your output at the end and you're happy and you do it with a given model, okay? With given direction. And this is generally how we, we think about computation. Uh, however, I think that as we are all here interested in cellular automata, we might simply think that in this process, which will go on, not everything will go perfectly. So uh, what happens if in some, kind, in some sense, whatever perturbation exists and uh, how we can study this phenomenon and how we can think about robustness. So I, I don't have any pre-established uh, doctrine to, to, to tell you. I want to think with you about this question, and really it's a question. So 
uh, don't expect here to see something that is finite with a beginning and, and an end. It's a really a question of research that I would like to share with you that I think, I hope you will be interested in. And uh, I'm really eager to, to listen to your reactions and questions. And there are two ways, two different uh, types of presentations. Uh, the first type is to have a very specified focus on some question and to present all the details. And the second question with the second type, which I have chosen here, is to be a little bit more, more wide and more relaxed. And as we were saying with uh, Professor Dipanwita Roy Choudhury at the beginning, we are living in difficult situation and we spend a lot of time with these uh, screens and uh, video conferences. So I didn't want to get too much into details, but rather to present something that is uh, a line of thought rather than very technical details. And please feel free if something is not clear during my talk to interrupt me. So uh, I hope that you all uh, can listen to me uh, well and um, and that you see the presentation uh, correctly. So just a little bit of actuality. Uh, uh, a few days ago, last week, uh, there was uh, uh, news which reports that apparently some part of China railway, railway, railroad was totally blocked during several hours because of a little software problem, which seems really uh, curious, because it's the deactivation of Flash, uh, the Flash uh, internet uh, system that was developed by Adobe. And this deactivation was planned a long time ago, but in fact, in some cases, there were some um, train controllers in this uh, part of China that were still using this. And the deactivation of this created a lot of problems, although it was scheduled since many years ago. But it seems also when I read a little bit of information that the person who set up this system uh, were kind of not working in the company anymore. So nobody knew how to deal with, the, with this problem. And they had to reinstall old computers and to see with Adobe to have the authorization to run this software uh, a little uh, longer, etc. And you see that some, we are in a situation, very fragile situation, very fragile. Because sometimes a little bug or a little something, even if we know about it, can lead to tremendous, tremendous consequences in our everyday life. So computation as it is now, in general, it is not robust in the sense that small defects can affect the whole thing. And this makes us very fragile. Okay. On the contrary, on the contrary, what do we see? We see that in biology, organisms are very robust in the sense that, well, of course, they die. They nothing is perfectly robust, but if you kill one cell or if you kill, uh, if you remove one part of a biological organism or some parts, it's very unlikely that it will affect the whole organism. Okay. But I like very much this, uh, this uh, seashells that you can see and that uh, uh, these seashells that I have programmed, they are, they are mine. So uh, you can see them. I often present them, for example, to, to my students. There are very nice patterns, which of course can be understood as cellular automata um, in some sense. In some, we can make very nice models of, of patterns. And uh, uh, we can really wonder if we can interpret, and it's interpret, I'm not saying that life is a computing thing, but what links can we do between different things that are living with a bit in biology, chemistry, economy, physics, and the cellular automata that we are studying. And how can we make these links between what we call the complexity of complex systems, which is different from the complexity 
in classical computing theory with this question of robustness okay so i would like to go in this talk very try to make some links with the fundamentals of this question and have a discussion uh, with turing and von Neumann, who who are the founders of this uh, of this field okay uh, just a little of something uh, why am i mentioning turing it's not only because he's the founder of uh, the, the basics of computer science with this um, computing model, which was later called Turing machines. But as you probably know, Alan Turing was also interested in the question of morphogenesis. Okay, morphogenesis, what does it mean? So in Greek, morpho means shape, and genesis means the birth, the creation of something. Genesis is the, the part. Uh, of the Bible that deals with the birth, uh, the creation of the universe. And uh, morphogenesis, it's a question that asks Turing. He says, how is it possible that we start from a single egg when we create an organism? This egg will divide. So all the cells that create the egg have the same information in some sense. But sooner or later, functions will appear and uh, you will start to, to make a head legs a tail etc how is this possible and how you, can you create a shape out of something which is symmetric so how do you create a symmetry specialization from something that is non differentiation no differentiation and symmetry and what's the solution he says he says I will invest a system of chemical sub substances. But the interesting thing is that at the beginning, even if the system is quite homogeneous, a pattern develops due to an instability of this homogeneous equilibrium, which is triggered by random disturbances. And please be attentive to this sentence because it can be the red thread it will be the red thread of all my talk, almost all. It's very, very profound idea that if you want, if you have something very homogeneous, like cellular automata are, and you want to break these homogeneities and create some kind of functionality, then you might use this mechanism that you make small random disturbance, and then you use these disturbances to create patterns. So I hope that uh, everything is clear for my goal. And uh, as I said, I will not go into technical details. Uh, I hope that the students among you will be interested in just reading papers and the researchers among you will be interested in opening maybe their, uh, their, their research field to, to domain maybe they have not dealt with so far so we'll talk about just make some simulations i will start with the game of life and present some simulation to show you what happens when we perturb some model i will show some biological uh, problems for example amoeba and flockings and given the time that i will have i will try to present some computational problem well-known computational problems like the density classification problem, global synchronization problem. And maybe if you're interested, we can talk about properties of self-corrections. So my leading question will be, how can we estimate robustness scientifically, meaning with uh, criteria that can be measured and how we can design some robust cellular automata rule. So also remember that my goal will be to have models as simple as possible. Always we can have models with a lot of states which make some nice behavior, but really we'll try to be as minimal as possible as Turing was thinking, as von Neumann was uh, also thinking when thinking about their problems. Okay. So I will not uh, repeat what is the game of light. All of you know that it was created by Conway. It has two states, dead or life. And you go to a birth 
if you, you look at your eight neighbors and if you have three neighbors, you go to a one. If you have, um, if you're one, so if you're living, you survive only if you have two or three living neighbors. Otherwise, if you have more than two, three, you die. If you have less than two, you also die, okay? And uh, what we will do is look at what I called an alpha asynchronous updating rule. What does it mean? It means that we will take the game of life and we first run it uh, with the synchronous traditional updating. So cellular automata are synchronous. They update, they stay all together. But then we will make this modification that with probability alpha, we will apply to all the cells the rule with the synchrony. And with probability one minus alpha, so with a small amount of error, we will say to the cell, don't apply the rule, keep the same state. Okay, so this is the model how we are going to perturb. So when alpha is high, when alpha is one, it's the classical model. And the more alpha will be lower, the more asynchronous it will be. Okay, I hope this is clear. If not, please just let me know. Okay, so now I hope that you all see the Fiat Lux simulation window on your screen. So Fiat Lux is a software that can be downloaded uh, on, on the web page. Uh, I, will, I will give you the link just uh, uh, after if, you, if you're interested or you just type Fiat Lux Seller Automata. And you just take the game of life, you choose here the more. So here we have 32 by 32, we can leave it like that. We have a torical environment that is the left and right uh, borders are glued together and north and south top and bottom borders are also glued together. So this is equivalent of having torus. And I click on open, I have my window which appears. So I can make the cell um, appear or disappear. And I will run my classical game of life step by step. I hope that you can see it well on your screen. And I will run my simulation. So this is the classical, you see glider has appeared here. It goes like this. And we see that some particular behavior is going on now. Uh, let, let us remember that this behavior is quite surprising because if you think about the rule of the game of life, it does not favor really life. It's favoring death, but the system somehow have this self-organizing pattern, properties or that happen. What we will do now is perturb now this and say now every cell will update, but with 99% so with 1% chance at each time step, the cell will not look at, the, at its neighbor and just keep as it is. What will happen to this? You see that the, the blinkers, the, these blinkers disappear, but we see that we didn't accept that for some patterns, for example, the blinker, which will disappear because we don't have this regularity of updating. The behavior is not very much better. Because I'm short of time, I will not have the time to decrease little by little, but you can do it by yourself. But now let's look at 50%, 50% probability to be updated with the game of life rule. And so with probability one half, I apply the, the rule of the game of life. And with probability one half, I do nothing. I just keep my state. <clears throat> and now, what do we see? We see that the whole behavior has been completely overwhelmed. You see, there is this amazing labyrinth pattern that has appeared. And you can see that not only a new pattern has appeared, but just think about one simple thing. 
even the density, the ratio, the number of ones divided by the number of cells, the ratio of ones, even the density has changed, you see? And, uh, uh, and it's not easy to understand why the density has increased because when we say alpha synchronous, we cannot predict really if it will increase or decrease the density or do nothing, you see? It's very surprising. So uh, there was a study, there was a study of this and uh, I will give you some references at the end, or you can go to my web page. And it was experimentally with numerical simulation proved that this transition from one particular state to another one particular state is what physicists call a phase transition. That is something that obeys very precise laws, especially, and there is a brutal transition from this first state to this second global state. And now, for example, if I do 10%, you will see that this new state will persist. So there is really a transition with this gradual variation of alpha. So this is very interesting and very puzzling and a uh, lot of things to do. I will not have time to get into details, but if you read some papers, you can understand. Just let me show you what happens, for example, for the majority rule. Majority rule, you look at your neighbor, if you have more zeros than once, you become one. If you have more zeros, sorry, you become a zero. If you have more ones, you become one. And this is the synchronous model from a random initial configuration. And now if I make it asynchronous, you see that contrary to the game of life in this, experiment we did not change now so the gate of light is not totally robust it's partially robust but not totally robust because somehow it changes but for example this majority rule is robust okay now we can look at the minority rule minority rule is do the contrary of the majority if you see more once you become a zero and if you see more zero in your neighborhood, including yourself, you become a one. So what happens is that in the synchronous behavior, there is this blinking, blinking pattern. If we do a little bit of asynchrony, what we will see is that there are blinking and defects. But if we have a low asynchrony, again, let me put, for example, 40%, what we see is now, a little bit like the game of life, but now it's even more perfect. We will create these stripes and the stripes will fight with this randomness in some sense, one against each other. The horizontal and vertical stripes have this kind of, uh, we can call it a fight until we have, like Turing was saying, we have created a pattern. And of course you see now the patterns are, are, are horizontal. And if I perturb it, it will correct. But if I run again the simulation, of course, maybe it will give us vertical pattern because we can never predict in advance what will happen. And now we see that there is this phase problem because the system has to stabilize in order to find an equilibrium. And now you see it has found a vertical, a vertical process. And if we perturb, it's very robust now because it has some kind of memory, okay? So, uh, these experiments really tells us that there is a whole continent, a whole field of research to be explored. And uh, I've been working on this question now almost since 20, 20 years. And I can tell you that there is a lot, a lot, a lot to be understood yet, okay? And this is one perturbation, asynchronism, as I told you, meaning that you decide to update or not to update. But of course, we can think of many, many different ways to introduce randomness in cellular. Okay, so uh, let me tell you now 
some kind, a new team, we will leave the simple world of binary cellular automata. And I propose to you to go more towards biology, but still have simple models, okay? Very simple models. And uh, the models as, are as follows. This is what you can see on your left. It's a particular biological organism which is called Dictyostelium discoide, the discoideum, sorry. So I invite you to do some research on this fascinating organism. Uh, this organism lives in a monocellular way. What does it mean? It means that in the forest, it's like an amoeba, uh, the cells live alone and if they feel that they lack food for some reason, what they do is that they send signals and call their neighbors and they say, come to me, come to me. And they make huge group, which count tens or hundreds of thousands of such amoeba. And they form what we call a slug. It's what you see on the left here on bottom, on the left photo on the bottom, and this slug will move and then a pronunciation will occur with the head and bottom and some kind of suicide will appear and it will form a stem. And then on the top of the stem, it will form spores and the spores can be taken by the wind and they will form a colony in another part. It's really fascinating. Okay, so, the question is, I was looking for a model to do this. A long time ago, I had a visit to, to Paula Flocchini and presented my model and she told me, oh, but this is interesting because in the field of robotics, we have the decentralized gathering problem. So you random, randomly gather, uh, you randomly scatter agents or robots and they have to group all together with some kind of minimal requirements, okay? So this is what we'll do with the cellular automaton. I will present you the model. So these are the, the real, the real uh, observation of patterns, how they form. And what you can see here in blue is this reaction, what they called reaction diffusion waves. And we will have some particles and these particles will emit waves. So we have a double layer, a double cellular automaton layer. On one layer, there will be a pure cellular automaton, which will be responsible for these waves. And on top of that, we will have these particles that will, okay? And randomly, they will emit waves. And when they see a wave, they will go to this direction. And we will, I will present you a simulation with Fiatlux. So with Fiatlux, what you can do is take this tab, which is called particle, and click on Dictio. Then you click again on Open, and you see here that we have a given number of agents or particles, the green ones, and you can change their initial density. For example, you can make 5% instead of 10, that would be less. And with them, I remind you, the decentralized gathering problem is that we want them to be grouped all together. So we can make, of course, complex, complex protocols to do this. But here, look what will happen. From time to time, cells with a given probability that is set here to 1%, they will emit some waves, and these waves obey the green bird casting's cellular automata. So don't be afraid if you don't have all the details now. I will give you the reference paper so you can then study all the laws that are described formally. Uh, maybe even I can give you right now in the chat uh, 
this uh, bibliography so you can have a look at it because I prepared a, a selected bibliography. It's a, it's a, it's a note. So let me just put you in the chat this address where you can find the papers here. And uh, so the paper uh, that I'm discussing this one, solving the decentralized gathering problem with the reaction diffusion chemotaxi scheme, social amoeba as a source of inspiration. So it was a 2010 paper. And uh, this is just to let you be aware that if I don't give all the details, it's because you can find them quite easily in the paper. So just be attention, pay attention to the main ideas. So the main ideas here is that the cells emit waves and these waves will allow the aggregation to take place. See, and finally, we have one group that has formed very rapidly, in fact. And the black cells are just here to say that we have sometimes different particles or different agents on the same square. So now, for free in some sense, I will take a larger grid. Let me do this with the free boundary conditions. Now it's not no longer toric. And look what I will do. Oh, okay. Uh, let me even have a greater screen to put this. Maybe we can have 100 here. Okay, I hope that you can see well. And I will put some obstacles on the grid. For example, this. And I will put some perturbation on the movements of the amoeba. So look, I will make a strong perturbation with 10%, 10%, the probability each amoeba will make a random noise. So at each time step, each amoeba, the probability 10%, will move randomly. So exactly like in the biological systems, the cells, the real cells, are subject to high noise. Here too, they will be subject to a high level of noise. And let's see if they will still be able to aggregate despite these strong perturbations. So again, they will emit waves. The waves will collide and merge according to the cellular automata rule. And let's observe what's going on. And we see the first groups begin to form. And what will happen is that the greatest a group is, the greatest, it will have a tendency to emit waves because it contains a lot of amoeba. The notion of group is an emergent phenomenon. It's not coded in the cells. The cells is really, remember, it's cellular automaton. So each cell only sees its eight nearest neighbor. But you see that some kind of intelligence has appeared because now the system is able to go around the obstacles and 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 then to take advantage of this noise and you see that now we have two main groups which will try to communicate and one group has captured another and now we have grouped all the agents so you see that it's very surprising how cellular automata that are perturbed with a lot, uh, a great level of noise can still have a very strong aggregation. Let me do another simulation, aggregating behavior and have very robust capacities of organize. Okay. Uh, I invite you to read about this model. I have another nice model, which I will present in two minutes. So, this is called lattice gas cellular automaton. So you have particles with four directions 
and these particles obey to a particular law. So they will reorganize, they will propagate. Again, you can see the papers to have all the details. And the only thing is that when the propagation is deterministic. So if you're heading, for example, to the to the <laughs> west, you will be on the right at the next time step. If you're heading to the north, you will be up, etc. But the interaction is simply that you tend to look like your neighbor. So if your labors have a tendency to go north, you have a tendency, it's a probabilistic model to go to the north. So let me show you also this model. Uh, it's here, you click on LGCA flocking. So you see that at the beginning, the particles, they don't know where to go, but they tend to form some groups. And remember, it's probabilistic, so there is no centralized information. I cannot know at the moment what will happen, but we see that there's a tendency to go north. So the colors are coding for the tendency uh, of, each, of each cell, for the direction, sorry, of movement of each cell. And you see that something has appeared. And this model was created and studied by Andreas Deutsch and Anja Vosböme in Dresden and collaborators. And it's amazing because here we have created a homogeneous movement which has this form of stripes. And if I repeat the experiment, okay, I have the st same stripe again, but exactly as I showed you, it cannot be, of course, always the same thing because it's random. So sometimes it will be in this direction. We have the four direction, which can be. And we also studied this, uh, this robustness of this. And we have shown that the, it's not always that you have a stripe. If, for example, the system is very crowded, you can have some checkerboards. And you have also states where no order appear. And again, as I was telling you for these binary systems, we have phase transitions, phase transitions with regard to two things, the density, the number of particles, and the alignment sens sensitivity, that is the tendency that you have to look at, at your neighbors, okay? So you see, uh, again, it's a second lesson that we get from biology with these two examples, but there are many others, is that if we make a clever use of noise, we can really create nice patterns and robust patterns. So this is the second thing. So I will now move to my third part. I remember, remind you, my first part was about binary systems, game of life, elementary cellular automata. On 1D, we could not have the time, but they have the same behavior. In my second part, I showed you inspiration from biology. And as Turing and von Neumann was th probably thinking, let us now jump into this field of computation. Of course, here, when I show you a simulation like this, we're not really computing something. We're just creating a shape. Uh, when I showed you amoeba and we wanted to aggregate, we are not also computing really something. But it can be the start of a computation, of course, because when you have a group, you can start computing things. But now I will try really to go to computation itself. And if I don't know your familiarity with the cellular automata, but if you are familiar with a little bit familiar with the field of cellular automata, there is a very famous problem, which is called the density classification problem. It's one of the problems of cellular automata, which has attracted most attention. It's not the only one, but it's one of the most uh, famous problems. And uh, its beauty is that it's very simple. It can be also called sometimes, it's called the majority problem. So you have, an, initi an, initi an initial sorry, condition and you have to determine only if this condition has more zeros and more ones. Okay. 
right? The only thing you have to do, uh, you need to answer this question, but which means that you have to then determine if the density of ones is greater or lower or lower than one half. Okay, it's very trivial, but now we are using cellular automata, which means that we cannot have a counter. We, you cannot count the number of zeros and number of ones. You don't have a head to write and, and read symbols as a Turing machine would do. So the computation of this majority has to be done by the cells themselves. And the answer needs to be a consensus, okay? So if you have more zeros, everyone should go to zero. And if at the beginning you have more ones, everyone should go to all one, okay? And of course, you have a restricted communication between cells. It's a principle of cellular automata. Okay, hope this is clear. So let us see what we do. Okay, here I, we have a formal, formalization of the, of the problem. Uh, so we can do it in 2D or in 1D. We have a given neighborhood. So you can look at your left and right neighbors, fundamental neighbors in 2D, whatever you want. And you have a local rule and you have a global rule for transition. But note that we can have also stochastic case. In some sense, we might be authorized, given what we see in our neighbor, to go to cell zero to cell one with a given probability. Not that each time we will see this neighborhood, we'll do this, not always. Sometimes we'll always also use stochasticity. So, uh, in the case of stochastic system, we, we need to extend a little bit the classical definition. So, because we are not sure of what we'll get from time t to, to, to time t plus one. So what we'll see, what we'll say, sorry, is that we have a configuration that is a fixed point. If for sure it will not be modified, this is intuitive, okay? And we will define the fact that for a given configuration, a given rule correctly classified as usual, if there exists a T, which is a random variable, because we don't know how it, much time it will take to converge, if the density is greater was it, of this was greater than one half and we have reached the fixed point all one, and of course, if the density was lower than one half, and at this random variable, we have reached all zero, okay? This is the definition. So it's a probabilistic definition from this. We can compute for a given classifier, the probability of having a good classification. It's exactly like the determinist case, but now it will be a probability of good, having good classification. For example, here we start from this initial condition. We evolve, we might get to all zero. It's a good classification because there was more zeros than ones at the beginning. Oh, sorry, also maybe if you are not familiar with this representation, so now this is called a space-time diagram. It's a one-dimensional system. And on the, on the horizontal part, you have the states of the system. On the vertical part, you have the time which goes from bottom to top. So when we have all zeros, it means we have ended the computation. So if we end to all one, it's a bad computation. And if we are still like here, we are still waiting, we have uncertain with it, it will be good or bad. So we run this statistically, for example, a great number of times, and we can know what's the quality of a classifier, that is its probability of good classification. Okay. So what is the theory about this? Uh, we start randomly, so each cell is randomly initiated with zeros and ones. It's a uniform choice. And I told you how we evaluated, evaluated the quality. So this quality that I defined to you can be done both for deterministic and stochastic or probabilistic. I use stochastic and probabilistic as synonymous for me systems. And in 1978, a long time ago, I think, these three 
uh, youth authors from the Soviet Union, Gash Kul Kur Dumov and Levin, constructed an, uh, a rule which was really good. Let me show you by simulation this rule. It's quite amazing because they found a way to have uh, a good density classifier uh, a good density classifier. So it's a uh, radius three rules, meaning that each cell we look at this three neighbors on the left, three neighbors on the right. And uh, let me start with uh, more zeros than ones. And look at this, and you see that converge very rapidly as it should to all zeros. It's a very clever way, very, very clever way. Sometimes you can see it can also be wrong. So here we should examine the initial condition uh, and see because was there more ones than zero. But anyway, uh, it's not a perfect rule. It's a good rule. And generally, it gives you the right answer but it's not perfect, okay? And so many pe people were interested in this and they were using genetic algorithms to look for rules. And in 1995, uh, a proof was given that no perfect rule exists. You cannot find a perfect rule to this. And uh, this is a, a, an article that is uh, known, but just be aware that in 2012, we, with uh, Anna Busic, Irene Markovici, Markovici, and Jean Mérès, we proposed a new proof of this fact, which is much more general and much more simple. And you can find it in the in the links in the link of the bibliography that I gave you. It's in this um, uh, this paper, density classification on infinite lattices and tree. So you will find a rule which hopefully you will find easier to understand and, and, uh, the, the, and uh, more general, okay? But let me come to the problem of noise. Uh, Henrik Fuchs was the first author to look at uh, the idea to perturb, uh, not to, to, to change a bit the system and there are different ways to change the system uh, in order to solve this density classification problem. So uh, you can change the interpretation, you can use different rule, you can use non-homogeneous systems, memory, whatever you want. But as far as using randomness, Fuchs was the first one to, to find it. And uh, he used a stochastic rule, but uh, the analysis, mathematical analysis tool at this time was, were missing and the quality of classification was not so good. Um, now we know how to, to, to quantify this. But interestingly, in 2009, Schuller, Martin Schuller from Zurich and uh, his collaborator, uh, they used the idea of mixing two deterministic rules. And uh, at almost the same time, I also had a similar idea, but in some sense, uh, the two rules that were chosen by Schuller were not the optimal ones. And in 2011, we proposed to mix randomly two rule. And I will show you what it gives. Also in 2016, we extended these uh, ideas of having randomness to solve the two-dimensional problem, which is in some sense more complex. But let me tell you what's the idea. So uh, if you're familiar with uh, elementary cellular automata, again, cellular automata in 1D, what you will see is that you have this traffic rule which moves the ones regularly. And you have this majority rule, which we always already discussed, which is you look at your ne left neighbor, yourself, your right neighbor. If you have more zeros than once, you become a zero. 
And if you have more ones than zero, you become a one. So according to the Wolfram encoding of rules, the traffic world the tra rule is 184, and the majority rule is 232. And again, as we were doing asynchronous, is you apply the rule with probability alpha, and you don't do anything, you apply identity with probability one minus alpha. Here, we will apply the traffic rule with probability one minus epsilon, and the majority rule with probability epsilon. So, do you see why this is a way to solve this density classification problem? So, let us make a simulation. So this is eta, but in fact, it's what I called epsilon. Let us start from more zeros than ones. And you see how this rule works. So if you're familiar with 184, this is very much looks like the, tra the, major the traffic rule. The ones are moving from left to right, and the uh, ones that are followed one each other it's like traffic jam and you know that the traffic jam go the other way around because they dissolve a little bit but the other cars are right it's it's an analogy of course and this is the traffic jam but the errors the randomness makes that once from from time to time there is this error that occur not every in every part but for example, when you have a, a series of ones, a series of cars, the car that is on the head will disappear. This is the randomness. This is the effect of doing the majority. So at the end, you will see that what will happen is that you will converge to the right answer of your computation that is all zero, as you want it. Okay? You don't know how much time it will do, how it will take, but you know that for sure, once the traffic jams, that is the ones that are glued one to another, have disappeared, you have a configuration which call an archipelago, that is all the ones are isolated, or on the contrary, all the zeros are isolated, if we have more ones at the beginning, and then by the use of randomness, you will make this one disappear. And we are sure that we will get zero. So this is the right answer. Of course, you are not sure of having the right answer because this majority can perturb the equilibrium. But you are sure that if, you see here, for example, if these two frontiers would have collided, then we wouldn't have had the right answer. So the beauty about this construction is that as epsilon will vanish, will get smaller, you will have probability of good classification that will go as close as you want to the perfect classification. It will never be one, but you can make it as close as you want to one. But also note that the time of convergence, that is the time of your classification, will also tend to infinity. So you have, you have to have a compromise between a good quality and a good uh, time uh, and the time that is not too long. Okay. I think I have talked a long time. I will just end with a very uh, a last simple example, but because it's beautiful also on this use of randomness. This last example is about the theory of synchronization. So uh, uh, it was observed by Huygens in the 17, and it's the fact that. Uh, you can have oscillators that will go together, okay? And uh, if you go, for example, uh, on, on, the, on the internet and you type 
synchronization of metronomes, you will see very, very interesting uh, films. Uh, this was made by a Japanese, if I remember, university. It's amazing. Uh, this was made by an American uh, university. It's also uh, uh, quite good. And uh, I have made this experiment myself. It's not easy. But you see that you have metronomes that are uh, at the beginning desynchronized and after a little bit they all oscillate together okay so just like synchronous uh, synchronization and how they do this they do this because they transmit a bit of energy to this uh, plate which is on cans okay and we want to do this uh, in the cellular automata uh, in the cellular automata field and for example here we want that from any initial condition we'll go to all zeros and all ones all zeros and all ones like an oscillation okay so this is a rule of radius two it works for this condition it works for this condition it works for this condition but not for this last condition because we have a cycle okay the difficulty is that we want to work it for any initial condition so there is some mathematics you can do about this different conditions you can show for example quite easily that if you have a radius one, it's not possible to find a solution. But what about any radius? The solution was found by uh, my colleague uh, Richard and also by another German uh, colleague, uh, Gaetan Richard from Caen and Marcus Redeker from, um, uh, from Hamburg, I think. They had the same ideas at the same time. If you look at the Bruin diagram, you will see that it gives us a way to construct an initial condition that will fool any any cellular automaton that you want. Okay, deterministic cellular automaton. So there's no perfect deterministic solution. And the idea of Gaetan Richard and Marcus Redeker is beautiful. And I have uh, presented it in, in one of my paper. It's not mine, but I repeated their idea in the paper uh, about uh, this synchronization. But now the good news is if you use a random system, it's impossible not to solve the problem. So what, we will, what you will do is that you will take that if you see zeros, you become a one for sure. There's no randomness. If you see all ones, you become a zero. There's no randomness. And after, in between, do whatever you want. You will be sure that you will get this alternative state. How is it possible? Well, it's because you have a big Markov chain to describe your, your evolution. And this Markov chain has only these two points that are absorbing. So you will go randomly in your Markov chain and theoretically, you can be sure that at the end, you will get this blinking state, okay? Well, of course, it can be rapid or it can be very long. And uh, if you look at the paper, you can show that there is a quadratic convergence. So it's polynomial time convergence in expectancy. Uh, and I think I have a conjecture that it's not possible to have more rapid that uh, uh, this quadratic time con convergence, but this is an open problem. This is a nice mathematical open problem. So to end my presentation, uh, also, um, different directions I'm working on with this use of randomness. First of all, what I call self-diagnosis. So uh, uh, the idea is that you have a network, a cellular automaton or given network. And from time to time, you have failures, but permanent failures. You have cells that will not work. Can you decide for the cells that still work that now it's time to stop? For example, you say, after 10% of errors in my system, we all decide to stop. So can we decide to do this? And uh, I'm working at the moment on the, using the reaction diffusion system that you saw and the idea of phase transitions 
uh, in order to have this decision and decentralized uh, decision that is taken. And also with um, Irene Markovici and Sia Maktati, we are working on what they call here self-repair, but you can call it also self-stabilization, or you can call it um, self-correction if you want. Uh, so the idea is that you put some constraints on your cellular automaton, for example, K colorings. What is a K coloring? So you have K colors and um, you don't want two cells to have two neighboring cells to have the same color. Okay. So you have, for example, four colors and you don't want two cells, neighboring cells that touch each other to have the same color. That's all. So the idea is that you start from a valid configuration, you perturb this valid configuration, and you modify it with errors, and you want to correct these errors automatically. Okay? And uh, if you have time, or, or if you want, during the uh, presentation, I, I want to stop this to give you the, the opportunity to, to, uh, to ask questions and to have a, a discussion. But if you want, uh, I will present you uh, some more uh, explicit examples with different colors in order to explain this self-stabilization uh, process. And um, I think that uh, especially as the seminar is, uh, is organized by uh, Indian uh, colleagues and Indian universities, I think it's very important because um, India has a very strong uh, electronics uh, technology, VLSI, and many things. And I think that the idea to have these robust systems or maybe self-repairing systems, uh, robust systems with various uh, uh, type of noise that would resist various type of noise can be interesting. But of course, it's a very interesting question in general. So. Let us try to recapit uh, recapitulate uh, this uh, presentation, what I have uh, uh, discussed, what I have presented to you. So, uh, cellular automata are a very rich object. We should never think about cellular automata as uh, being one particular uh, angle of course, when we do research, we have to have one particular angle, but it's very, uh, we should, we, we gain if we have this large scope. And three, uh, I, I like very much to present cellular automaton as the confluence of three um, points of reflections. First, uh, we want to think a cellular automata as models of computation. So input outputs, but not as classical input outputs with uh, circuits and gates. Of course, as for example, Pro Professor Morita has presented to you in this uh, series of lectures, we can make circuits and gates and it's very interesting topic and we can think about reversibility and it's very huge, nice things. But we can also have some kind of new openings uh, about this model of computation. For example, as I tended to show you with this density classification problem. We can also think about uh, discrete dynamical systems, that is per se. We have different we have different systems and we want to know how they behave. Okay. For example, with uh, Professor uh, Shukota Das for this asynchronous system, we ask the very simple question is if we have an asynchronous system where each cell is updated this time one after the other, chosen randomly, when is it that the system will return to this initial to its initial condition almost surely? That is, with probability one, it will return to this initial condition. And this has led to a very nice mathematical study. And I invite you to ask uh, Shukanta uh, to, to, to have um, the details of this study. Okay, so you can ask very simple and beautiful question uh, about discrete dynamical systems. And the third point, of course, is to be interested in what goes on in nature. Okay, we can make nice models 
also although simple of natural phenomena and uh, if we do this we can try to establish a dialogue between computation and this natural phenomena and the question i i i, I asked is about how can we assess the limits of classical computation so if we have a given computation what is interesting is to say oh, okay if i make this perturbation it will resist or it will not resist if i do this change it will resist or not resist so we what i like about uh, the idea of robustness is that we try to explore the limit of different computing models and last but not least which is uh, i would like to go to this fundamental question is always Taylor or Thomas um, are making links between natural systems and computation. This goes back to a very deep philosophical question is does nature compute, to put it bluntly, okay? And uh, this is a wide question, we cannot answer it, but it's very interesting to see that it has roots in the work of what happened in Europe in the 17th century where, for example, uh, Galileo or Descartes was thinking about nature. And they were the first person to write in all letters that nature would follow mathematical laws. To which extent this is true, to which extent uh, everything can be described in terms of, of mathematics, it's really a deep question. And uh, for example, Leibniz with this principle of sufficient reason Nihil estine ratione had a deep thought. And I always think as uh, uh, being in dialogue with Turing, von Neumann, uh, and all the cellular automata researchers that are, we are in dialogue also with uh, these uh, uh, philosophers. Thank you very much for your attention. I was uh, very pleased to be with you uh, today. And I'm uh, waiting for your question. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I can see some questions are coming. Uh, thank you, Najim. So, beautiful talk. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I'd like to one point. Uh, I'd like to add one point. So, yes. you are you are talking about three aspects. Three aspects. Uh, one more aspect we can add here in case of cell automator. When cell automata uh, uh, are being used technology. So, especially the there are many uh, Indian uh, you know uh, researchers who explored uh, cell as technology, especially in the era of VLSI. Okay. Yes. Uh, so yes. that aspect also of can be uh, uh, explored and uh, studied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. And, and this is why uh, I think that having some directions of exploration with this question of noise is going to be a very rich uh, research direction and yes. India has really this possibility to do this research because we have a strong community about this. Okay. Uh, so I want to uh, you are talking about this. Are all cell automata robust, equally robust? Sorry to come down. I, I cannot hear you very well. I don't know why, but there is a kind of noise. Yeah, yeah, some noise. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, but some uh, noise is coming maybe from your side. No, I don't think it's from my side. Yeah, yeah. I have admitted you. Okay, uh, Najin, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, are all cell automata, my question is, uh, are all cell automata uh, equally robust? That, that's, that's a good question. In fact, th this is really what I have devoted a lot of my research to. They are not equally all equally robust. Not at all. Uh, uh, some cellular automata as soon as you perturb them a little bit, 
everything will be changed. Uh, think, for example, about the shift. The, the shift rule, for example, if you do small modification, everything will, will change. And there are many things like that. Uh, because some cellular automata strongly rely on this property of being synchronous, you see? And on the contrary, some others, like I presented, for example, the majority, I think the majority is one of the most robust function. And uh, you know that when you have noise, you have tendency to, to use majority. So there is a whole spectrum between the most robust and the most sensitive. And this question, I invite you, it's really, uh, I think it's a very deep question, uh, to look at this uh, tutorial that I have uh, written last year, in 2020, for example, it's, if you're interested in the mathematical aspect of things, this is the paper that you can see. And, uh, on, and the encyclopedia entry, which is more general. So I would like to make it very clear the work I have done is really partial. And uh, sorry, uh, I, I copied the same thing. Sorry, it's, it's a mistake of mine. Yes, uh, I wanted to make it clear for the audience that it's only a partial work. And in order to estimate what is robust and what is not robust, all the ideas are welcome. And we can have a lot of different measures we can have a lot of different way to estimate. So uh, it's very open and it will, of course, depend of what you are interested in. There is no universal definition of robustness. So uh, everything, everyone can propose a definition. We can compare our definitions. We can compare our measure and uh, it's very open. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, then uh, my next question is, uh, if all are not equally robust, okay, then what is the relation between this robust net and computational universality? So, uh, so that they are having yeah, different yeah, computational, power, uh, computational yeah. power. So, if very one says question. robust, and is it, you know, what is the computational power of that C, robust C? Yeah. yeah. Excellent question. Uh, you know, for example, the game of life is the most known cellular automaton that is computation universal. And you have seen that the game of life, the game of life does not resist the asynchronous updating. And it's funny because uh, uh, there is a paper which I have written and the title of this paper is Does Life Resist Asynchrony? So it, it I put it on the chat also. It's directly re related to your question, Shukanta. However, now let me say something. And it's the same for rule 110, for example. Uh, I can show you a simulation of asynchronous 110. You will see, for example, that this famous elementary cellular automaton that is known now to be Turing universal, if you do a little bit of perturbation, for example, 10%, you will break this, uh, these um, particles and you will see that chaos will appear and you will not be able to make any, any, any computation. So in general, in general, robustness and universal computation go in orthogonal ways. They go in orthogonal ways. However, you can make specific, specific constructions in order to make any cellular automaton, you can make it robust to asynchronity. So you can see the, the, first prof, uh, the first researcher was a Japanese researcher called Nakamura, and he presented 
uh, a construction with whom you make a counter, you look at your neighbor, you see, am I in advance or, or not? So if you're in advance with regard to your neighbor, you just don't do, don't do anything and wait for your neighbors to join you. And by doing this technique, you slow the computation, but you make it robust to asynchronism. So you see, um, as far as asynchronism is concerned, you can, you can add a top layer on your cellular automaton to make it robust. And as far as noise is concerned, it's very open. So uh, uh, it's a question we are interested in, but for example, uh, Peter Gash has a lot of complex and difficult construction of cellular automata that try to resist small amounts of noise. But let's, let us say that it's complicated. It's not easy to make such construction. So uh, my answer is also very open. I would say that in general, if you don't do anything, take uh, a universal computation model, you add noise, you add perturbation, it will collapse in general. However, if you make specific construction, you can make it robust. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi. Monica, any more question? Hmm. Uh, any question? Hi, Nazim. This is Meghna. Yes. Um, Hello, Meghna. Pleased to meet you. Again. We met in. Yeah. Uh, we met in Ghent. <laughs> How are you? So uh, you spoke about. I'm good. I'm good. I yeah. Good. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Um. So you spoke about three different angles of looking at um, cellular automata. Yes. Uh, so you, you spoke about the dialogue between the first and third, right? So what about yes. like viewing, what about the dialogue between viewing it as discrete dynamic entities and natural phenomena? Sort of like, yes. like uh, natural phenomena and like ecosystems yes. or something. Uh, it's exactly what I have been trying to do. And... Um, I would say that it's it's, um, it's a, also a rich domain, very promising. But I want to say something also. It, it's something that I discussed with many colleagues on cellular automata. I want you to think about something. In physics, in physics, if if you study the laws of physics. Uh, laws of movement, uh, then you take these laws and you will be more or less able to apply them to predict, to, to construct, uh, say, a rocket, a system, a train, or whatever, etc. So uh, I would say that in physics, there is a very, very strong connection between experimental work and the theoretical basis. Okay. But in the field of cellular automata, to my feeling, these connections are not so strong. In general, you, you see researchers that are specialized in one of these three angles, and the dialogue between the three angles is not so strong. Okay? I see. So I don't know why, I, I have no clue why. But uh, if you're interested to work in the field of cellular automata, or if there are young persons here, I will really try <laughs> to push you towards uh, being exactly at uh, examining the, the dialogue between this dynamical system theory and computation or dynamical system theory and the modeling. But in general, people who do modeling, they specialize in their model, they make complex, very complex model, don't try to simplify and have the tools of dynamical systems. And people who do computing, they have tendency to make complex things. So uh, really, it's a difficult question because 
it gives maybe a message to the young sons to go towards this direction. I see. Thank you. That makes sense. You're welcome. Hello, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, I'm Vishwanath. Good morning, Vishwanath. Good morning. Yes, good morning, sir. Uh, sir, in the context of uh, Professor Sukantazar's uh, uh, question, sir, I want to say that, uh, sir, uh, you told that not cellular automata, not all cellular automata are robust, but we make cellular automata robust. So, can we say that yes. SCA uh, has always has some limits? We have some limits. That is. Big. Exactly, exactly. It's exactly the idea I want to convey. It's exactly the idea of I want to convey. Thank, thank you. It's a question about limits. It's a question about limits. And uh, this is why I was telling you at the beginning about this, this, um, uh, this uh, uh, failure of China railway, etc. As our life is going to be more and more dependent on computers, we really, really, really have to say what are the limits of our system, you see? Because if, if something fails and everything collapses after, it will create huge, huge, huge catastrophe. Okay, thank you, sir. Mm. Uh, sir, one you thing... Me, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yes. Sir, not Yes, so another sir uh, that can you give some insight on archipelago states that uh, it is some kind yes. of uh, that you told that classification is certain in if we reach yes. that. Uh, yes. Yes. So uh, is yes. it a kind you, of? Uh, you want me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You want me to clarify this? Yes, yes. So is is it a kind of yes. a fixed point state kind of things or any? No, no, it's it's it's, it's rather. I, I will I will make the simulation again. Uh, what I mean by this, it's not a fixed point. It's that um, here, yeah. So here it's not an an, an archipelago because we have cells with two ones. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. So now we don't know what will happen to the system because there is some probabilistic, there is some randomness in the system. But what I mean is now we know. Now we know because the randomness, if you look at yes. what happens between this traffic and majority, the randomness does not affect all the transition of the cellular automaton. It affects only part of it. So what I'm saying is that now, there is some randomness, of course, otherwise it will be only shifting. But the randomness, I am sure of what will happen. I don't know when it will. So this is what I call an archipelago. There is no two ones next to another. All the ones are isolated now. And I am sure of what will be the outcome of the computation because the only randomness can happen is that the one that is here leading will disappear. This is the only thing that will appear, that will happen, sorry. And little by little, I am sure that I will converge to all zero because the randomness can only be in some transition, not all of them. So how long does it take? I don't know. Can do calculus. And now you see average. So this is the archipelago. It's a configuration where you can be sure of what will go at the end. And this you can prove it easily mathematically while well, you have understood what's going on. So you can do a mathematical thing. What I can tell you is that you can add then some noise. You can add some noise. Ah, you see, let's start from a very low density, for example, 10%. And uh, what is interesting now is that the model ha now is perfect. So now it's different because at each time step, I added real noise. 
each line step you add some noise. So this property of archipelago is not really valid. It has some validity that you see that you create some more and more bigger archipelagos, which and the ones will disappear, etc. So you see, it's interesting because now we have something that is a little bit robust to noise because it stays with a low density. But mathematically, we can prove that sooner or later, this information that we are on a low density state will be lost because we're on a finite system. And this property is called ergodicity. And let me do the simulation. You see, it's, it, it does resist. Ah, and now it has been lost, you see? So it's also a beautiful question to determine the property of ergodicity of stochastic CA. And uh, there are a lot of experiments, a lot of theory, and the density classification problem that I told you about, it originally comes from the study, the theoretical study of ergodic system. This is the origin of the density. So you see, uh, to, to, to answer you, these um, systems are dependent on which kind of perturbation you apply to them and uh, which kind of noise you apply to them. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Komalika, Ibrahim has a question. Hi, uh, Nazim, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Ibrahim. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, yeah, good presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. Thank so you. I, thank I had a question that maybe you've already answered, and maybe um, um, you know it's common knowledge already. But maybe I've been out of the field so long that I've forgotten now. <laughs> but you mentioned robustness um, does not always necessarily stabilize a system, if I'm correct. Um, and when it does, it's very good. Okay, so if 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 if, it's this, if a system is robust, then you know after some perturbations, the system um, goes back to where it was in a sense. Yes. Can we yes. maybe use that to achieve a desired state? So can we maybe use um, randomness to perhaps mm -hmm. achieve um, some state that we uh, desire? Is it possible to do that? Y yes, yes. In some sense, it was the what we are doing here in, in this uh, simulation here. So let me put again zero. This is what we do because Remember that if the density classification problem is that if there are more zeros than one, we want to converge to all zeros. So it's exactly what we want to do. We want yeah. to use this randomness to converge to all zero. Okay. Yeah. You see the, 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 the state. But maybe you're thinking that the perturbation can always be there at every time. Yeah, I mean, so 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 the natural yeah. way we think about perturbations is like a fault in the system. Okay, so now what? Yes, a fault. Uh, so, so now what yes. you're saying is, so here it's not necessarily a fault. You can actually use it to our advantage. Yes, and so for example, here if we use the 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 if we use the noise at each time step, exactly, it comes back. We want to to always have a low number of faults, but we see that. Uh, I know that this system, for example, here is not is not ergodic because it's finite and there are theor mathematical theorems. And if you remember, Ibrahim, for this presentation about uh, the particles, dictyostelium. So let me again put some obstacles. It's always more fun to see them involved with obstacles. Here we put some noise, a strong noise. And they will aggregate. So this is what I call, in my language, a desired state. 
of course, here there are some particles that are trapped, some amoeba that are trapped. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry, I should have put 10 and not, you see here. Yeah. And if you perturb this system, it will again go back to this, this state, to this desired state. You see? Thank you. Yeah. So indeed, you. yeah. yeah. And, and again, if you look at um, uh, simply, if you want to play with, with Fiat Lux, as I told you, for example, look at the minority, asynchronous minority. For example, here you can create a checkerboard. And if you pressure the checkerboard, it will very, very rapidly go back to the checkerboard. So it's exactly the, the direction of the work is the main idea that you have to remember that if a system can achieve a desired state in spite of randomness, asynchrony or noise, it will certainly be robust to many perturbations. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Kamalia, I cannot hear you if you're talking. Kamalika, <laughs> next question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I, uh, if anyone else have any other question, then. Hello. Uh, Raju. Hello, uh, sir. Myself, Raju, sir. Uh, I want. I want to know, sir, on question. Uh, I have one question, sir. Does the robustness yep. depend on which kind of person quantity you use? And so you use fully asynchronous or you are uh, alpha asynchronous any? Is there any dependency? Oh yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good question. Yes, it does. It does depend. It does depend on the the kind of asynchronicity that you use and. Uh, with one of my PhD students, whose name was Olivier Bourré, we uh, looked at different types of asynchronous updating methods. So, uh, very good question, because you can think asynchronous as, do I update myself or do I not update myself? But you can think as a loss of information for your neighbor also. For example, uh, what happens if you lose information for, 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 from your neighbor? And this is something we have studied. And I, I will put you the reference, uh, not this one. This is the reference. If you don't have access to the paper, please send me an email and I will send you the original paper. And a uh, very good question. And we were surprised, very surprised, to see that these phase transitions, this uh, difference of behavior, qualitative difference of behavior, they, was, they were quite dependent to the type of asynchronism. So also, I invite you really to invent your own type of perturbation, to invent your own type of asynchronism because we can think of many, many ways. Uh, there are some we have proposed, and there are some that you can invent yourself. Thank you, thank you sir. Okay, uh, I have one last question to ask you. So you were talking yes. about this uh, reversibility yeah. of uh, asynchronous system. I have one thing to ask if uh, yes. this reversibility has any relation with this robustness. Can a re reversible system be more robust or uh, uh, what do you think about uh, it? Uh, good question. Good question. Um, uh, good question. Really, uh, I don't uh, would say that I don't know. But I can I can give you some examples. I can give you some examples. If you take the 
most noisy uh, cellular automaton. That is, I don't look at my left neighbor, I don't look at my right neighbor, and I do whatever I want. For example, I change my state randomly. Of course, this cellular automaton will be very robust because it does not compute anything, and it will be reversible because you visit every possible configuration and then you go back to, to your initial condition. So uh, this would be for sure very robust because there is no precise computation involved in the cellular automaton. So uh, the answer can be yes. In some cases, reversibility does mean robustness because the reversibility comes from the fact that you are noisy and you are not doing anything interesting. But the contrary can be true also. Uh, you can have different other cases. For example, I think that um, uh, I'm sure, I am sure that I can also invent some examples of systems that would be recurrent or reversible, that is, they have this ability to go back to the initial condition, but if you perturb them, uh, they will maybe jump to another attractor, so change their way, okay? So uh, I think that in general, the systems that are reversible and uh, recurrent, they will be indeed maybe more robust than the others, but I don't think it's a universal law that will be always valid, you see? It has to be explored, but it's a nice research question. Really, it's a nice research question. Okay, understood. Thank you. Uh, so maybe uh, you have almost two hours of time, so maybe I have to conclude here today. Thank you you for your time such a nice talk and so like so such interactive session uh, we are really happy to have you with us so okay let me conclude here today and uh, as i declared first that we'll be concluding this webinar series by another talk the first uh, this session of webinar series will be concluded by the last talk that we have requested for Professor Shukanta Das to give us. So I request all of you to please uh, join us on that day. That is on 28th of February. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming. For this thank nice topic. Thank you for the invitation. We have all enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very happy about this. And, uh, feel free to write me your question by email for all of you if you want. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. Bye.